of the war crimes. Okay, now we're starting. So I start again. So good afternoon, everyone. This is Maria Varaki, Dr. Maria Varaki, lecturer in the national law. And together with Professor James Gow and Professor Rachel Kerr, it's our pleasure to welcome you to the first webinar of the War Crimes Research Group series for this academic year. This year, the War Crimes Research Group will run throughout both terms. Uh, having said that, we're very happy uh, to initiate this year's series with the presentation of a very, very excellent and interesting book of the Siege of Sarajevo with two prominent academics and experts on this field. And with this very short welcome, I would like to give the floor to Professor Kerr uh, to initiate the webinar. Thank you all. I look forward to seeing you to the rest of the series. Thank you very much. Um, Maria, and welcome everybody to um, this webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Maria said, we are really delighted to be kicking off the series um, with a presentation from Paul Lowe and Kenneth Morrison on their new book on um, the Siege of Sarajevo, reporting the Siege of Sarajevo. Um, so we have an hour. Um, the presentation will be about 30 minutes. Each, um, each of Paul and Kenneth will speak for um, about 15 minutes each, and then we'll open up um, and have some time for questions and answers and discussion. So we'll take questions in the Q&A box. So if you have a question, feel free to pop it in there while um, the presentations are going on and we'll come to them um, at the end of all of that and, and take them and answer them. Um, so pop your questions in, the, in there. Um, so before we start, just by way of brief introduction, you can see um, a bit about the book and also a, a link for a discount if you'd like to order a copy um, on the web listing for this event. Um, and also a bit more information about um, Paul and Kenneth, so I won't spend too much time introducing them, but just to say, um, Professor Kenneth Morrison is Professor of Modern Southeastern European History at De Montford University, and Dr. Paul Lowe is Reader in Documentary Photography at University of the Arts, London. Um, and I, for one, and I'm sure all of us, really look forward to hearing more about, um, about this amazing book, Reporting the Siege of Sarajevo. So over to you, um, Kenneth, I think you are going to be starting if you want to load up your slides. Thank you. Okay, yes. that's, that's there, great, over to you. I'll, I'll begin again. Um, we're gonna spend about 15 minutes each talking about uh, reporting the Siege of Sarajevo, which we published uh, with Bloomsbury in January uh, this year. Uh, it's a project that Paul and I worked on for over three years. Um, and um, it was quite a serious endeavor, uh, writing that a kind of history of how the siege was reported. Our focus is primarily on foreign correspondents uh, as opposed to local media. But of course, we do discuss those um, locals that worked very closely with uh, foreign correspondents in Sarajevo. And one of the most fascinating things about this period is the construction of the journalistic infrastructure that was needed to report from a city uh, under siege. So much of the first half of the book focuses on the, the creation of that uh, journalistic um, infrastructure. So the book, it was in, um, uh, now how do I move this on? Uh, to the next slide, there we go, apologies. So this is the first detailed uh, study uh, of the work of foreign correspondents in Sarajevo. Of course, there have been many uh, books written about the siege of Sarajevo, but none have had this uh, particular uh, focus. The aim of the book is really to kind of analyze how journalists functioned within uh, a besieged city. Uh, and of course, doing so required, uh, well, it was a real technological endeavor to make this whole um, uh, infrastructure uh, function. So throughout the book, we focus on the, the creation of this journalistic infrastructure. We deal with the changing technology because of course, the siege of Sarajevo also happened at a time in which you had the introduction of um, digital technology. So the way that journalists changed 
fundamentally transformed between, let's say, 1992, when at the very early stages of the siege, the only way that journalists could get stories out was using, um, if they had satellite phones, very few did at that time, and some were using existing telephone lines, of which there were very uh, few in the city. But one of the other changes that took place, certainly during 1992 and 1993, was what, what Paul and I described as the armorization uh, of reporting. Um, and at the end of 1992, most big agencies were using armored cars in Sarajevo. All journalists, or most journalists, were wearing flat jackets, helmets, and so forth. And of course, that brought its own particular problem in terms of uh, reporting uh, daily events. Now, for us to do this, um, of course, we worked with the available primary and secondary sources, but um, we, we were required really to interview participants. And for this book, we interviewed around about 100 uh, journalists, stringers, translators, satellite engineers, drivers, mechanics, and, and so forth. People that were involved in the whole building of the infrastructure that made it possible to, uh, to broadcast eventually live uh, from uh, Sarajevo. So I want to talk a little bit about that infrastructure first and, and the creation of it. Here you can see a, a picture, actually one of Paul's pictures of the, the Holiday Inn uh, Hotel, which is of course the famous journalist hotel in Sarajevo. Um, even by the standards of war hotels, uh, this one was particularly interesting. Uh, most war hotels that we think of, for example, the Caravelle uh, in Saigon or the Commodore in Beirut, um, None of these hotels were directly on a front line. Uh, the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo, of course, was only 500 metres away from an active front line and was within a uh, siege line. So it was a particularly hazardous um, uh, place to stay. What it did have is it had an uh, underground car park. Uh, it had electricity, it had its own generators. So it could provide for journalists who were, uh, who were staying in Sarajevo and covering the siege of Sarajevo from there. Not all journalists stayed in the Holiday Inn. Uh, some stayed in private, uh, private um, accommodation. Uh, Associated Press were based in uh, the Belvedere Hotel, which was near the Kosovo Hospital. Um, but the vast majority of those foreign correspondents working in Sarajevo stayed uh, in the Holiday Inn uh, Hotel. This is a black and white photograph, so unfortunately you don't see this wonderful uh, lurid yellow, brown uh, and grey uh, colour of the, the Holiday Inn, but it is a a uh, somewhat unusual uh, building from an architectural uh, perspective. Now, the Holiday Inn didn't reopen until late June. Um, I think the precise date is the 25th uh, of June, uh, 1992. Originally, when journalists arrived in Sarajevo after the events of the 6th of April, which of course, shots were fired by Radovan Karadzic's henchmen into the crowd of peace demonstrators uh, from uh, the fifth floor, in fact, of this uh, hotel. Most journalists that arrived in Sarajevo at that time were based in Belgrade, and they would simply come from Belgrade down to Sarajevo, report on events, uh, maybe for two or three days and go back uh, to Belgrade. However, in mid-April uh, 1992, the foreign correspondents began to base themselves uh, in the city, and they based themselves primarily in a hotel on the outskirts of Sarajevo, in Ilija, called the Hotel Bosna. Uh, and it was there for the next month that uh, they reported on the early developments of the, the siege uh, of, of Sarajevo. But on the 15th of May, um, 1992, as there was more fighting around, in, uh, around the area of the so-called Ilija Hotel complex, there was a mass evacuation of, of journalists. Uh, many of them left on the 15th of May, went down to, to split uh, in Croatia. A very small number stayed behind, uh, including John Burns, uh, the New York Times, for example. Um, but, but the vast majority left uh, during that period. And actually between about the 15th of May and about mid-June, there were a very, very small number of uh, foreign correspondents based uh, in Sarajevo. At that time, Sky got something of a scoop because Sky News were based in Pali, uh, which uh, of course was outside Sarajevo and was the, the wartime headquarters of the, the Bosnian Serbs. Uh, they managed to get into Sarajevo through Lukovica, um, and some of the most visceral images of the, the, the shelling of Sarajevo, particularly of the parliament building across the road from the Holiday Inn, were taken from the top floor of the Vojna Bolnica, or the military hospital. Uh, Sky News had been permitted to use that to film, um, and they used that position for, for several days. 
uh, to film the shelling of, uh, of Sarajevo at the, the end of May, beginning of June uh, 1992. However, in June 1992, foreign correspondents began to come back to Sarajevo and they came back in greater numbers uh, after the, the city's hotel uh, was reopened on the 29th uh, of June uh, 1992. Here you can see inside the holiday, and this is Chris Helgren uh, of the BBC, and you can see the large satellite uh, umbrella, satellite phone umbrella, uh, hanging out the window of the, the Holiday Inn. Um, the Holiday Inn was particularly, particularly useful for um, radio. Yeah, I'll turn the volume down for now, you can turn it again. But also when you get to the other end, switch the network back. I think we've got a tiny bit James, of could you go on mute? We've got you, thank you. So yes, radio journalists could use relatively easily. They had a communications infrastructure within the Holiday Inn uh, itself. Uh, if you wanted, of course, to send images, television images, you would have to use the TV station building, which was another uh, part of that journalistic uh, infrastructure. The Holiday Inn was also something of a kind of social and communications hub for, for foreign correspondents. And here you see um, uh, Jonathan Landy, Chris Helgren, John Burns standing. Uh, their uh, Pulitzer Prize winner who reported uh, on the siege of Sarajevo and the war in Bosnia uh, for the New York Times. So the Holiday Inn became a kind of central, very important kind of part of that uh, infrastructure because it's where most uh, journalists resided. Here you see the Sarajevo TV station on the left hand side, um, uh, built originally in the 1960s, extended in the 1970s and again just before the uh, Winter Olympic Games of, of 1984. It was one of the most robust buildings in the city, certainly, um, but it was one that was also targeted on a, a number of occasions. Um, on the 28th of June 1995, it was um, actually hit by a modified air bomb, um, uh, killing uh, one member of staff and um, injuring several other uh, foreign correspondents who were, were based uh, in the TV building. But the TV building became a really important part of the infrastructure because if one wanted to send images out of the city, uh, filmed uh, images, uh, visual images, they had to do so uh, from the, you could send photographs uh, using a satellite phone, but you could not uh, send footage. One other interesting thing that developed as a consequence of um, foreign correspondents uh, operating in a very dangerous environment was the creation of the Sarajevo agency pool. Uh, so in the summer of 1992, Mar on the suggestion of Martin Bell, uh, of the BBC, that essentially camera crews shouldn't all go out into the city to attempt to garner footage. They should basically send one or two camera crews out and those camera crews would then come back and the footage would be pooled. So they would essentially share footage uh, between themselves. Now that was quite an interesting development, particularly in a, a context whereby journalists and cameramen tend to be very competitive. Uh, therefore, the creation of the Sarajevo agency, although not unique, uh, was um, something uh, somewhat uh, unusual. But the Sarajevo agency pool also had, uh, as well as many other agencies, uh, had a space uh, at the television station from which they could uh, broadcast their images. Now, key to this was the European Broadcasting Union, because without the European Broadcasting Union, Sarajevo didn't have a satellite uplink. The European Broadcasting Union first um, uh, established a satellite uplink uh, at the Hotel Bosna, um, but when they were evacuated from there on the 15th of May 1992, uh, there was no satellite uplink in Sarajevo. There was one in Pali, but not in Sarajevo. So what happened was in mid-June 1992, the European Broadcasting Union sent in a special operations team led by Miriam Schmaus, uh, who created a satellite uplink in the TV station, which was then used by the Sarajevo agency pool and uh, all of the other uh, agencies operating in, in Sarajevo. So the EBU's uh, equipment was, was absolutely key to making the whole thing function and of course um, uh, that was one of the really interesting things about writing this book that we already knew quite a lot about how the BBC functioned or CNN functioned within Sarajevo but less so about how the European Broadcasting Union functioned and we managed to, to interview track down almost everyone who was involved uh, from the, uh, at the EBU uh, during this time. The other building that was very important was the, the PTT building, which of course was the, um, uh, the headquarters for uh, the UN uh, in Sarajevo. And here you see uh, the UN team or staff being grilled by journalists uh, during the so-called nine o'clock follies, 
uh, the nine o'clock follies took place in the PTT building um, more or less every morning, in which journalists would turn up uh, to be given the UN's perspective uh, on events, not just UNPROFOR, but various UN agencies uh, would give uh, briefings there. Uh, the term nine o'clock follies is really borrowed from the, the, the Vietnam War, um, uh, famously at the Rex Hotel uh, in Saigon, the US military used to give the body count uh, that were uh, dubbed by uh, journalists as the, the five o'clock follies. Well, Sarajevo had its own version, the so-called nine o'clock follies that took place at uh, the PTT uh, building. Here you see again another uh, image of journalists um, uh, at the PTT building asking questions of either the UNHCR or uh, UNPROFOR. Now, of a part of that infrastructure, of course, journalists had to be able to move around the city uh, with relative ease. Um, one quite interesting thing about Sarajevo is at the beginning, you could get in and out relatively easily. But at the beginning, it was getting in and out by road because the airport was until uh, the 29th of June 1992 uh, closed. After uh, 29th of June, you could get into the city uh, on flights from Split or Ancona um, to Sarajevo airport and then hopefully uh, get transport from uh, Sarajevo airport to uh, at least the PTT building. So at the beginning of the siege, journalists were really driving around in, in soft skin cars. And you can see this old BBC Carlton, um, which uh, was Martin Bell's crew. Uh, the cameraman there you see is Nigel Bateson, uh, who was one of the BBC cameramen who was working in Sarajevo, both with Martin Bell and uh, John Simpson. I think Eddie Stevens is the, the sound man there. But you can see they were extremely exposed. There was no protection. And in a city which uh, they were often subject to sniper fire, um, journalists needed uh, equipment. They needed cars, armored cars that would allow them to traverse the city uh, more easily and with the level of protection that they required. But the trigger for this really was the killing of the um, ABC producer, David Kaplan, just outside the airport. In fact, not very far from where this photograph was taken. That happened in August 1992, just a few weeks before that, the CNN uh, camerawoman Margaret Moth uh, had been seriously injured, again quite near the airport outside the Oslo Virginia building. So by the autumn winter of 1992, the use of armoured cars and flat jackets and so forth is becoming much more commonplace. Now you can see that both uh, Nigel Bates and Eddie Stevens are wearing flat jackets, but these don't amount to much more than stab vests, uh, essentially. So what we begin to see is agencies investing quite large sums of money uh, in buying armoured uh, cars and, and flat jackets and helmets and so forth uh, for their correspondents. And this is one of the BBC's um, uh, uh, vans or trucks that they, they had bought, Land Rovers. Um, these had been previously used in, in Northern Ireland. They were bought from the Royal Ulster Constabulary. They were then refitted by a, a mechanic called, uh, well, in fact, he wasn't just a mechanic, he was in charge of the BBC fleet, Alan Heyman. Um, and then these were either built in situ, uh, so they were taken in different parts and then constructed in Sarajevo, or uh, they were uh, shipped in uh, to, uh, well, taken to Split and then driven from Split uh, into the city. Not all of these armoured cars were completely armoured, some just had armoured cabs. So basically where the driver and the passenger are sitting would be armoured, but other parts of the vehicle uh, would not. But in any event, this became much more commonplace by the end of uh, 1992. And it's an interesting period, of course, because this is leading us on to where we, we, we got a decade later in Iraq, where journalists are not only driving around in armoured cars, but sometimes have their own security detail uh, and so forth. I think it was James Mates of ITN that was uh, had his own security detail when traveling to Tikrit um, in, uh, just after the uh, invasion of um, Iraq in, in, uh, in 2003. And he was much criticized for, you know, uh, why would a journalist be traveling around with a security detail? And was that actually, uh, you know, that, that's deeply problematic when the journalist can no longer be, in a sense, objective. Um, either because they're embedded or either because they're traveling with the security detail. So this was in Sarajevo, the, this was the beginning of the process of armorization uh, that um, uh, became much more commonplace throughout the 1990s and, uh, and early 2000s. But I'll pass on to Paul now because Paul's gonna discuss uh, technology uh, and a little bit about ethics and the ethical challenges uh, that uh, journalists faced 
uh, while operating in, in Sarajevo. Uh, oops, sorry, I just need to get to the right slide. Okay, great. So, can you see the, the you can see the screen pop? It's not you're not seeing my presenter notes, are you? Yeah, I can no. see it. Great. Okay. So yes. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks for that, Kenneth. Um, yeah. So the book has this sort of two halves, as Kenneth said. The first half is a kind of narrative of the the process of how journalists started off with very very little organisation, very little infrastructure, and built up over that period of the siege into quite a sophisticated and complex operation. Um, the second half of the book is a little bit more analytical in, in the sense that we take particular themes that emerge from our research and look at them. Um, and the first thing we looked at really was the sort of daily reporting life. How did journalists cover the story on a day to day basis? Um, and as, as Kenneth said, you know, the majority of journalists covering this were relatively young. I mean, I was one of them. I was a photographer in my late 20s. And it was a, a war that was broadly covered a lot by what we would call at the time stringers or super stringers who were freelancers who had a kind of semi-contract basis with let's say a newspaper or a radio company. And obviously we had, you know, staff reporters were there as well, but a lot of the war was covered by stringers and super stringers. And it was a generation that had sort of been drawn to Eastern Europe often uh, just after that, the, the Romanian Revolution and before the Berlin Wall, and they'd sort of established themselves in places like Budapest and Bucharest and so on. So they had some familiarity with the area. And then obviously when the conflict in former Yugoslavia uh, broke out, it was a much bigger, much more complex and much more violent story than, than they'd been used to covering. So we were literally learning on the job in, in many ways. It was very much sort of that sense of trying to find out what's going on. Um, the hotel, the Holiday Inn had this kind of focal point really. Not everybody stayed there, but everybody went there. And it was, it was a space where journalists could talk with NGOs, with various strange black market dealers, with all the sort of, it was a kind of focal point really. And you would start the day and end the day there, trying to find out what was happening and getting um, reports from your colleagues. So this is David Reef talking with a, a colleague in the lobby of the hotel. And it was a very peculiar place because the hotel is, is like this kind of castle or sort of fortress, if you like, in the center of the city, um, overlooking both sides, the sort of side out towards New Sarajevo and the airport, and then the side towards the old town. And it's also very much um, on the front line. It was literally, you know, meters away from the, uh, from the front line in Gerbovica. So it was a very, very vulnerable and very dangerous place, but also it's kind of in a strange way protected. The Serbs did shoot at it occasionally, but it was a sort of an easy truce around it. But it was a very much a place where, the, where people defined the terms that are so familiar to us now, terms like ethnic cleansing. You know, I remember sitting in the lobby here with Roy Gutman and, uh, and um, I think Alan Little, trying, they were trying to decide, could we call what was happening in Priador and Eastern Bosnia and Western Bosnia when the camps were just being discovered in August 99. Could we call it genocide? Did it meet the requirements to be called a genocidal act? So this is a really interesting kind of moment where a lot of the vocabulary that we're so familiar with today was being established. Um, the, the period is also, we, we argue, very, very important in the sort of history of journalism in the sense that that decade of the 1990s does mark this transition in lots of different ways from one type of journalism kind of into another one. Sean McGuire, who was uh, working for Reuters and went on to be the head of Reuters News in Europe, said, you know, it wasn't so much this was the first of a new war, it was almost the last of the old wars, where there was still a sense of some sort of front line. It was still predominantly two uh, government level institutions fighting each other, whereas the sort of conflicts that we're seeing now are much more the kind of new war style with all sorts of different uh, um, armed groups who are not necessarily at state level. Um, and it was also, as Kenneth said, it was a technological shift from analog into digital. It also marked, in a way, a kind of shift in terms of the business of journalism from the idea of journalism predominantly as a kind of public service uh, activity into something that's much more dominated by advertising and revenue streams and business. So journalism sort of shifting into a business, if you like. So um, this is Charlotte Eager and Michael Montgomery in the hotel uh, dining room. And it was a very strange atmosphere. You can imagine there, even at the height of the siege, the waiters were still dressed up in bow ties and dinner jackets serving as rather thin soup and food and so on. Um, so it was this kind of strange haven where you could still operate. And as Kenneth said, it had electricity at times, not always. 
people had generators, so they could file stories. So Charlotte Eager was, was a great interview. Uh, uh, um, she's very, very typical of this, of this group of journalists who came out here as stringers. She started out working for the Daily Mail and then, then ended up working for contract for the Observer. And so she was working for a weekly newspaper, which meant the rhythm of her white, she described it brilliantly as saying, she'd just graduated from Oxford in I think English literature and she said it was it was like kind of um, going back to university and you know writing your writing uh, your writing schedule was very much like writing essays you kind of had a week to write your essay or your story you had four or five days to do your reading or your research in the field you had to write it for the deadline to get it into your supervisor or in this case your editor and then you'd have Sunday off and then you start the whole process over again and this is sort of fantastic way of understanding how the rhythm of the week worked for some of these reporters and Charlotte was also very typical of what happened to a lot of journalists then they became incredibly attached to the story it really did capture the imagination and in some ways the emotions of a lot of journalists because although we were you know living in the hotel we still were out on the streets a lot we were with families we were staying with families there was a very strong connection emotionally I think and psychologically with the citizens of the seas this extraordinary situation where you had this very modern European city, very much kind of in the same space as it were as, as Europe, the rest of Europe and Britain and so on. Um, taken back to the Middle Ages, this kind of Middle Ages siege with, no, with the electricity cut off, constant bombardment. And it was like this giant psychological experiment of how, do, how would people like us respond to that? How would, you know, an educated um, suburban or urban uh, uh, civic value sort of be, be expressed in a situation like that. And that was endlessly fascinating, I think, for journalists and for their audiences. And so Charlotte was typical of several reporters who followed individual families, you know, for years, literally through the whole life of the siege and reporting on the, the cultural life of the siege as well. You know, the ex exhibitions and, and uh, concerts that were put on, the sense of the city resisting the aggression through not just fighting on the front lines, but also through defending the values of what it means to be a citizen of a city. Uh, as Kenneth said, technology shifted a lot in this period. So at the beginning with photography, you know, we were shooting film, developing our, 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 our film in hotel bathrooms, scanning it with some of the very first scanners and the, the Hasselblad film scanner scanned a 300 kilobyte file, not megabytes, but kilobytes, which took 45 minutes to transmit over a satellite phone. And by the end of this period, you know, they were shooting digital cameras that would, would transmit it almost instantaneously. And this is an example of, of the Tandy. It was a little laptop that ran on batteries, which meant it could be used even when there was no electricity, uh, little AA batteries. And this is a reporter sitting in one of the, uh, I think in the Reuters office in the Holiday Inn, getting ready to file his story. And at the beginning of the conflict, you know, we, they, they were still filing manually by literally reading the story out word by word to a sub-editor, which could take an hour to transmit a story. By the end, they were using sat telexes and other, you know, digital transmission devices that would allow the story to be uploaded in, in minutes. Um, one of the very interesting sort of things that emerged as well is this was the period where CNN was establishing itself as the 24 hour rolling news. And this became the sort of dominant uh, model for a lot of television reporting. And this idea of the tyranny of the two way, and the two way is when you, know, you go live to the reporter on the scene to uh, his editor in London or New York or wherever it might be. And this has actually gave a, a lot of drama and immediacy to reporting, but it was also very problematic because it meant that a lot of the time the reporter was tied to the hour or half hour news bulletins. And it meant they couldn't actually get out and report on the story. So Martin Dawes of the BBC, for example, gave us a great interview where he talked about during one of the NATO airstrikes um, in, I think, 1994, he was basically unable to leave the hotel because BBC World Service, BBC News, BBC Television, BBC Radio were constantly going to him for the latest update. And it was almost, it was incredibly frustrating him because he actually wasn't able to give them an update because he wasn't able to go out and report and find out what was actually happening. He was only able to sort of, um, you know, give them what he could see literally out of the hotel window. So there was a flip side to this technology, to this advances, this kind of live news, the ability to broadcast live from the field in a way was counterproductive in terms of actual journalism. Um, as, as Kenneth said, we did think a lot about the ethics of reporting and Sarajevo and, and the siege in general threw up a lot of really difficult problems. Um, the sort of idea of journalism that if you tell the story honestly and truthfully and present the facts to an audience, that they will then do something about it was really challenged, I think, by the siege of Sarajevo and more broadly by the conflict in Bosnia. Uh, because you know there was evidence, very clear prima facie evidence of 
of war crimes and atrocities being carried out very, very early in, in April 1992, never mind August and so on. Um, and nothing was done. So there was a real disconnect between the, um, the narratives that were coming from, um, from um, the, the journalists on the ground who were predominantly saying, you know, we can clearly see there is one major aggressor attacking uh, a, a relatively undefended civilians. The arms embargo is, is, is not doing any good at all to prevent that. You know, we can see atrocities being carried out. We can see war crimes. We can see very um, uh, um, uh, difficult situations being happening on the ground. Uh, something should be done. This is a prima facie case for intervention. The narrative that was coming from the embassies and the political elites in, in France, Britain and America particularly was, oh no, this is all ancient, ancient ethnic hatreds. They're all the same as each other. They're all as bad as each other. If we intervene, it'll be another Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that obviously that story you know, went on for the period of, of three years. So it was a real challenge for many journalists to the sort of fundamental tenets of why you do journalism and how you do journalism. And this led you know, Martin Bell in particular famously to come up with this idea of the journalism of attachment, uh, which is also supported in many ways by people like Alan Little and, um, and Christian Amapur, who argued that in the face of war crimes, trying to give both sides equal Pre, equal crescent, uh, credence and equal coverage is unethical. It is, it is absolutely um, uh, beyond the pale, really. So they were defending the journalist's right to take sides effectively and to call out um, genocide and atrocity and war crimes when they see it. And my computer's just gone a little bit nuts. So I'm not sure I can actually seem to have frozen somehow. So apologies for that. I'm gonna, I was gonna try and move on to the next slide, but my computer's got a bit crazy. Wait a minute. Let me just try. Ah, there we go. Okay, I've got it now. So a warning, a warning, a random warning popped up, um, and obviously this took a. This also took a, a, a pretty difficult toll on the journalists themselves. I'm going to flip through these pictures quite quickly because they're quite disturbing. But you know, having to report, particularly for the photographers, I think, uh, because they are right in the in in the heart of things, right in the middle of everything. And we got some very powerful interviews from Chris Morris, who was the photographer there in the morgue, and from Enrique Marti, who took that picture of the killing of a young boy called Nerman Dubovic, uh, who was killed by a, a Serbian sniper right in front of the Zamaisky Museum in the, in the heart of the city in front of the Holiday Inn. You know, th they were very honest, uh, brutally honest, really, about how th it affected them personally, emotionally, and, and in some ways, you know, for the rest of their lives, suffering from some of the trauma of that, but also their frustrations at how they were producing these very powerful images of atrocities, of killings, of the daily violence, and it wasn't having any impact in, in, from, through their readerships on government policy back in the States and back in Europe and back in the UK. So um, I think I'm going to end there. I've got some, I'm going to keep on with rolling through some photographs while we do the Q&A. These are some of the uh, work that I did in the city, but I think we can move to some questions if you want, and I'll keep the slideshow sort of ticking over as we're doing that. Thank you very much, Paul. It'd be great to go through the questions. Actually, one of the questions I had for you was whether all of these photos are, are ones that you'd taken. Are they all your photos in the book? Or they yeah, so um, most of the ones you've seen now, there's one or two by Kevin Weaver, and the colour one at the end there is of, of, of Nermin is by Enric Marty, but the rest of them are mine. Yes, that's right, yeah. And then this is a series now. I did a, a sort of landscape project during the siege, um, because I was really fascinated by the fabric of the city and the texture of it. So I did a series of panoramic and square format pictures of the sort of landscapes of war, which is what I'm showing you uh, at the moment. I'll just kind of go through this, those as we go through the, the, uh, the Q&A. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. And I, you know, I've got tons of questions I think I could ask you, but I'll try not to, um, but I'll just, I just want to pick up on a couple of things um, as we go to the Q&A. We've got one question in there already, which I will come to, um, but do put other questions in there. Um, but one thing I was really struck by is this is the sense that um, you, know, you both said that many of the people reporting, many of the journalists reporting on the siege were fairly young and inexperienced. And I wonder what impact that had on reporting um, and whether it's the same, the same people stayed um, throughout it and then sort of linking into your last point Paul on attachment um, you know it's quite striking how you we know some people still being, obviously yourself still being involved um, very much in the region and, and involved um, heavily now on the kind of peace building reconciliation side uh, Roy Gutman as well I uh, wondered mm -hmm. how many others there in this sort of sense of 
attachment is not only during the reporting in the sort of mm -hmm. Martin Bell sense, but the sort of long longevity of that and, and how it sort of makes a mark. Yeah, I mean, I think to your first question, yes, I mean, there was definitely a Sarajevo core. There was a, a sort of a central group of people that covered the story continuously. I mean, they weren't there every day, but like myself, they would go in, come out. So the BBC, for example, had a rotation system and Reuters. So the main agencies had uh, a rotor system where journalists would typically go in for a month at a time and then they would be rotated out to rest and recuperate, and then they would go uh, back in again, maybe two or three months later. Although having said that, very often, it wasn't like you were going on holiday. You would go from, and I, I went from, you know, Sarajevo to, to Somalia, to Chuk Grozny, back to, 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 to Sarajevo again at times. Um, so there was a sense of sort of people coming and going, but, and there were people that just came for one day. There were kind of dateline journalists who would arrive at the airport and file their copy and then fly out again without having even seen the city, but they would get that dateline of Sarajevo under siege. But by and large, it was a story that was covered by a fairly tight knit, fairly small group of people. So people like Alan Little, Kurt Shork, Martin Dawes, um, you know, Sean McGuire, uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Eager, and obviously, you know, um, John Burns from the New York Times. And they were people that, that either stayed there, extended, I mean, John Burns kind of moved to Sarajevo effectively for that period and was there for months at a time. So, it, and it really did capture the imagination and the hearts, I think, of, of many of the journalistic community. And I think that's definitely evidenced by the fact that, um, that, that we had a reunion in 2012 of journalists who'd been covering the conflict. And a lot of people were quite nervous about coming back. They felt maybe a bit uncomfortable about that. Would the city really want to hear again and be kind of reminded, as it were, of that past? But something I think like 300 journalists came in the end because there was an invitation from the city and, and the response was very powerful from the public. People were really sort of saying, you know, yes, it was really important that you came. You did, despite everything you did do, a very good job because it could have been even worse if it hadn't been reported on. Um, and, and a lot of us at the time were saying, well, you know, there hasn't been a, a, a reunion in Kigali or even in Kabul. It's, it's not the kind of place that you would have that reunion from. And we're now talking about doing another reunion for the uh, 10 years on from that for the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the siege in 1992. So definitely it's a, it's a place that's remained close to the hearts of lots of the reporters that, that covered the story. Absolutely. I wonder if I can just turn to um, Professor James Gow quickly, James McCaw's co-convener of the Crimes Research Group, um, and has also been sort of involved in following this from the beginning as well and giving testimony at UICTY. James, did you want to ask a question, make some co comments? You're muted. <laughs> Trouble with these things. Stupid people. Um, <clears throat> anyway, thanks very much for all of that. Uh, first thing I want to say is that I hope we get an answer to Gabriela Kiefiskaite's question I've just seen in the chat at the end. Um, I had a few kind of thoughts and observations, and if I would like to have seen the book, I'm very much looking forward to seeing it, and it would be a different discussion, I think, in that light. So you know, with that caveat, I had a kind of few observations. One is about the change, and I think the change that came through that Hugo period in the early 1990s was a kind of democratization. There were some of the technological changes coming, uh, there were changes in the professional structures and working, but in part they kind of were part of this democratization. And one of the things about Bosnia in particular, the whole Hugo lands, uh, was that they were quite accessible. So lots of young people yeah, with cameras, video cameras, you know, it's the age of the portable. And that's and kind of a benefit of that uh, in the long term is the richness of material that's been left behind. Uh, and of course, from the locals, we should never forget the locals in all of this, uh, both journalists and ordinary people capturing stuff. So when it comes to some of the great documentaries, uh, 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 Death of Yugoslavia and Balkan in Flemming, both of which I had it, and in spring to mind, the material available is almost like any other thing. People often talk about Vietnam as the television war. It wasn't. It was a war on which there was lots of film that came a week, bits of film that came a week later. Yeah, this was rich, dense environment. Uh, and I think and it was a kind of democratization and that has changed. Yeah, Paul mentioned the changes in technology, but those really yeah, kind of, it was the, the, the small foothills of the changes we have now with people with their devices, everything everywhere. Uh, 
second observation was when Paul spoke about the tyranny of the two-way, and I'm really glad this is raised as a point, uh, because there were many times I'm aware of, and not just in Bosnia and Yugoslavia, but you know, Iraq as well, absurd situations where the expectations that the editors, the producers have, uh, and that they believe that their audiences have, I mean, you've got to have somebody standing there in this place, because that gives it authenticity. But in fact, the people speaking to camera are being fed and told what to say down the line by the editors, because the people on the ground don't actually know what's happening. And it's, and, and I, I think drawing attention to that is such an important aspect and interesting element of the things going on. Uh, third, I think, you know, when you spoke about, I think, I think this was Paul, not Ken, but I'm not sure which one of you said this about yeah, journalists' right to take sides, uh, referencing Martin Bell. And I'm not, is it a right to take sides or is it right to be objective? And this is very much striking at the BBC and a, and a, and a bizarre idea of objective that means a bit of this and a bit of that is objective yes, rather than an independent evaluation of the evidence. Uh, and uh, a last couple of things. Uh, the point on ethics yeah uh i was struck that paul skipped over a couple of the difficult images consciously saying so uh and maybe that's probably quite rightly but there's a whole discussion to be had about those kinds of issues uh it's difficult to say talk about this because I, I recently read an essay that's been considered for a prize about images of victims of the Holocaust and the ethics of reproducing those images and showing them when there's no permission from the users. Uh, and in an age of GDPR, that becomes even more sensitive. But I, can, I wonder if there's any thought on that kind of the use of these images, pros and cons. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, uh, of course, your book's about Sarajevo, well, that's your experience and, and, and uh, it's a big attention. But to what extent do you think the journalistic attention to Sarajevo uh, was a distraction from everything else going on everywhere else, mm -hmm. because yeah, it was there, the journalists were there, uh, and in a way it was a story that kept itself going uh, and meant that a lot of the time other things went unnoticed. Anyway, thanks very much, it was great, really entertaining, uh, but do somebody make sure to answer Gab Gabriela Kefiskaitis question. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, lots. Go on, sorry. If I can go just on. add that in, thank you very much, James. Maybe if I just, there are a few questions and really brilliant, um, interesting questions. I really hope we get to all of them. But shall I just read out Gabrielle's and then I'll I'll go back to you, um, Kenneth and Paul, and you, and then we'll take some more after that. Um, so Gabrielle asks, thank you. Says thank you for the wonderful presentation of the book. Considering the extent of reporters' exposure to possible atrocity crimes, to what extent do you think reporters have a responsibility to provide evidence to courts? And how do you feel about such a prospect? I don't know if that's something you covered in the interviews as well. It, it is. Can I just pick up on this, Paul, first, and then you can come in? Of course, of course. I mean, there, there was a divide among journalists uh, who reported from, from Bosnia, not just from Sarajevo, whether they should, in fact, give evidence to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So a number did. Martin Bell did, Jeremy Bowen did, Ed Vogliami did, um, the guy who worked for Sky News, Van Linden, uh, he also gave evidence, but there were those that believed that they shouldn't, that it wasn't the job of the journalist, it was the job of the journalist to, to, wit to bear witness, to report, but not to give evidence in a court case over which they had very little control, and for some, they saw the ICTY potentially as politicized or being used as a kind of political instrument. So they, um, they, it was really interesting that divide that opened up between the, the press corps within Sarajevo regarding this. Paul can probably talk in a little bit more detail about that, but there was a divide. It wasn't um, by any means, there, there wasn't by any means consensus on that issue. Yeah, absolutely. And it was definitely something that was actively debated and people argued with each other about whether they should or not. And I think in the end, it was down to individuals' conscience about whether they... I mean, it's interesting, the whole thing, because, you know, the, the flip side of that argument is if, you know, would you give evidence in a police trial against the sort of left-wing protester? You know, and so, for example, at the moment, the NUJ in Britain would defend the rights of photographers not to give their film to the police if it was a public order incident, for example. So it's, there's some very interesting kind of, you know, uh, nuances in these kind of situations. Um, from the point of view of broadening it out a little bit from just from the siege of Sarah, the, the, the interesting thing about the way that photography was used predominantly in 
the war crimes tribunals is most of the time it wasn't used for the way that you might think it would be sort of uh, initially you might think that a photograph showing an individual carrying out some form of, 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 of an act of war crime would be prosecuted that specific individual but that's not how images were generally used by the ICTY they were used more as corroborative evidence to establish command responsibility for senior leaders and as part of that kind of general sense of this is this is this was going on in multiple locations and here's evidence that it was happening in these different locations so low-level competence uh, carrying out acts of, of, of violence and, and executions were not being prosecuted themselves, but those images of them doing those things were being used to, to prosecute their commanders and so on. And that's sort of more or less stayed the same, you know, to the present day. Um, in terms of some of James's other questions, yes, I mean, the, the tyranny of the two-way, absolutely crap. I mean, I remember standing on the roof of the TV station at uh, one o'clock in the morning photographing Christian Amanpour, who was uh, during the NATO airstrikes, who was going live to, to Atlanta. And they were saying, what can you see? And clearly she couldn't see anything because it was dark and she and the, you know, nothing was literally nothing was happening. And it was it was it did become almost absurd. As you said, James, you know, in one ear is coming their editor or their political editor from one end and then the other ear, they're trying to actually find out what's going on. So it is it is deeply problematic. I think uh, I would say that from I think that the, 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 the again, as, as Sean said, that this was in a sense one of the last wars of the old type because it, it, it's just before social media took and the camera phone and the sort of mass, um, you know, citizen journalism and the mass amount of information. It's just before that happens. So I think, you know, in Iraq and, and to an extent, even Afghanistan and some of these other conflict zones that we're seeing today, so much more media is being produced by, you know, by combatants themselves, for example, by civilians, by journalists, by, by local journalists and so on. So I think in a way, Sarajevo in particular marks the kind of high water of that classic old school journalism approach. Um, and before we kind of get this whole new landscape of different types of media outlets coming through. Um, a couple of other things that you mentioned. Um, yes, I think absolutely right. You, I think the way you formulated it, I think it was a lot of the journalists were saying, yes, to be objective in against war crimes does mean, doesn't mean giving both sides equal credence. It means looking at the facts, surveying them, seeing, you know, coming to an opinion or a justified opinion on who is carrying out, who is the, the, the aggressor and who is the, 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 the victim and saying that, that that's the case rather than trying to give both sides equal, equal credence in, in that. Um, so uh, I think one thing, one thing I just, one thing I did want to, I forgot to mention earlier on, which James reminded me of, I think one of the things that we do uniquely in this book as well is we don't just, we didn't just interview and talk to the kind of superstars, the Alan Littles and, and the, uh, the James, um, sorry, the, the John Burns's, we talked to producers, to fixers. Obviously the, the, the local fixers were very, very important in this. In fact, without them, none of this would have happened. And the whole kind of the role of the fixer in all of these different uh, international media situations is supremely important and, and must really not be forgotten. And so that whole kind of, as, as, as Kenneth said, the whole sort of ecosystem or ecology of how news is produced is something I think that we opened up quite effectively in this, in this book in a way that in, in a sense, that's one of the, the bigger sort of themes that we draw out from this case study specifically of Sarajevo is how you, know, you, see the, you see the TV reporter on the screen. What you don't see is the whole network of other people and other things that are happening to allow that image, you know, that 30 second report to actually get onto your, to your television. There's a whole kind of set of things that go on around that with producers and editors and, and so on and so forth. We went into quite a lot of detail about some of the microcosms of how that actually happens and so on. Mm -hmm. I wonder, should I pick up on the just very quickly the question about armorization and yes. journalists arming up? It's Richard's question. Um, yeah. Really interesting. I mean, we, we, we interviewed, of course, lots of journalists, but also lots of producers. So producers based at BBC or CNN, um, they saw it as their obligation to protect uh, their people on the ground. So actually, within a relatively short sp space of time, within two or three months, you know, journalists had armoured cars. They were provided uh, with armoured cars. We have an interesting story about the business around armoured cars in just a moment, which Paul will convey. Um, but many journalists did resist it because they felt that it created a barrier between, you know, the ordinary citizens of Sarajevo uh, and they were reporting about that experience. You know, could you really interview someone in the street who was not wearing uh, a helmet and a flat jacket? Could you really approach them in a helmet and a flat jacket? and interview them, it obviously created this kind of barrier. Many of the local staff refused to wear flak jackets or helmets or even drive around in armored cars because they it was their city 
and they were reporting the experiences of their, their peers, their friends. So they didn't want to be, you know, wearing uh, flat jackets and helmets and so forth. And there's no doubt that it had something of a, uh, an impact. By 1994, you can read some critiques of the uh, journalists in Oslo Virginia or Vreme, in which, you know, local Sarajevans are being interviewed saying, you know, we, we don't meet these people. We just see them driving around in armoured cars and they go in and out of the Holiday Inn. Uh, and, um, you know, there's no dialogue between them and the ordinary citizens. Now, of course, journalists would rightly say that, you know, ordinary citizens of Sarajevo maybe didn't need to be out on the street all the time reporting. Journalists did. And because they were doing that, that job, and it was a very dangerous job in the context of a besieged city, then they, they needed to protect themselves. But there's no question that it created a, a psychological barrier of, of, of sorts. But vis-a-vis -vis armoured cars, there was something of a, a trade that uh, emerged in armoured cars. Paul, it's a great story, so just tell this one. Right? Yeah, so... so um... We, we found a fantastic story from Gary Knight, who is a, a very good photographer, but who was also is also a very, very entrepreneurial uh, character. And quite early in, I think in 1993, he realized that there was a sort of gap in the market for providing armored cars to clients effectively. So he decided to, along with another photographer friend of his, to invest in an armored car as a, and then to try to rent it to American TV companies. So he, he, went, he get, went back to the UK and he found out the company that makes these Kevlar armored cars uh, in the Midlands somewhere. And he went for an interview with the... Um, with the, uh, the manager and said, I'd like to buy an armored car, please. And the gentleman was like, well, absolutely. We've got one here. It's ready to go. It's 60 grand. Uh, do you have the cash? And he was like, well, I've remortgaged my girlfriend's flat and I've, I've raised the finances. I said, OK, can we see your um, arms dealer license, please? It's like, oh, I don't have one of those. Do I need one? And so because it's a, it's, it's a weapon, effectively, it's a military, it's a militarized vehicle. So in order to be able to buy one, you actually have to be a licensed arms exporter. So um, Gary went off and managed to get the paperwork and succeeded in buying this armored car and immediately signed a contract to ABC television to rent it for, I think, a whole year at, you know, a couple of grand a day or whatever it was. And, and on the back of that created a very successful sort of sideline business where by the end of it, he had about five or six armored cars and half a dozen uh, soft skin Range Rovers and Land Rovers driving in and out of Bosnia, sort of up and down the road from Split. Um, so he was probably the only journalist ever to actually have well, maybe that's not true, but certainly the only one in Bosnia to have a legal uh, status as an arms dealer. So that was a pretty good uh, story that came out from the from the um, the other the other the other armored car story was Chris Morris, who was the time photographer, who had himself a bespoke uh, F one fifty armored truck, American, um, you know, big sort of you know the classic American pickup truck built with with armored uh, an armored cab, and had that flown out, and that was the kind of fanciest, most plush sort of V eight powered armored truck in, in the area. Everyone was very jealous of Chris's, uh, Chris's beast. Um, I might just comment I on Michelle's- I feel like there's another book to be written about the yeah. intersection between journalism and arms dealers. Absolutely. Now, or maybe a, 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 a script to be written. Yeah. I wonder if we've only got a couple of minutes left. I just yeah. want to tie in. There's a couple of questions about the relationships between the journalists and other agencies, other people. Yeah, I was going to, that was what I was going to come yeah, to. The so Martin question. Yeah, so Martin Philcott says, yeah. um, you've mentioned your interactions with the UN humanitarian agencies. Did you have interactions with military political representatives of the warring sides? And how yeah. would you characterize those sure. interactions? And then similarly, in a different, slightly different vein, but related, Michelle Hughes yeah. asks, if you can comment on the relationship between the reporting effort and the Western military commanders on Yeah, and I'll tie that back into James's point as well about the way that Sarajevo sort of dominated the news agenda. Um, to a lesser extent, Vitez did as well, you know, in central Bosnia when that conflict broke out, largely because there were British forces deployed there and it became a kind of hub for the British reporters to cover that. So, yes, I mean, uh, you could argue uh, in, in one sense that the kind of overriding media focus on Sarajevo uh, took away from what was happening in other parts of, of, of particularly in, the, in what was then Republika Srpska. Having said that, you know, it was it was much more difficult to work on on the uh, on the Republika Srpska side. Um, you know, journalists were escorted around. Usually they were sort of uh, taken care of you. It was harder to get to access to things. So there was a sense in which uh, it was much more difficult to operate on that side of the of the story. Um, and it was a lot easier uh, to operate on the Federation side. And, you know, especially when Vitez sort of opened up 
uh, the British Army, obviously, it was before the, the, the concept of embedding. So it was, so in, a, in a sense, it's probably the last conflict where we were allowed to travel with British Army units without having to go through all the kind of complicated paperwork and, and, and signing off your life. Because uh, I, mean, I remember drive, riding around the back of, of Saracen and, and Scorpion armored personnel carriers and armored cars and so on with British troops without any kind of great, great fanfare and just being allowed to do whatever you wanted effectively. Um, in terms of access to commanders and so on, yes, I mean, I would, I would argue that the, the journalistic court gave the, the, the UN NGO leadership and the military leadership a pretty hard time. Um, in a lot of those nine o'clock folly press conferences, you know, people like Alan Little and, and Kurt Short particularly did press the UN forces very, very hard on, you know, what were you doing? Why were you not responding? Why were you allowing these things to happen? Uh, why were you not calling for airstrikes and so on? So I think there was definitely a sense of, of, of the journalist, journalistic core pushing back, not simply, you know, sort of neutral reporting and, um, and just being kind of fed the news as it were from these military and, and these other political sources, but actually actively questioning them and actively pushing them and, and trying to sort of move the agenda forward really in discussions um, with them. Um, and then in terms of the, uh, you were saying about political leadership. Yes, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the Federation political leadership, you know, at the beginning saw journalism and journalists and access to Western journalists as being the way to get their message across. And, and I think perhaps naively assumed as many journalists perhaps did that if you told what, if you made it clear what was going on and how, for example, the arms embargo was massively um, impacting on the Federation side compared to, or the, on the Bosnian side compared to the Republic of Srpska side uh, in terms of their ability to fight back, that something would be done, but obviously it wasn't. So there was a naivety, I think, at the beginning on, on all sides in that sort of political space uh, about what journalism could achieve and what it couldn't achieve. Um, and so, yes, I think um, there was definitely a lot of contact between journalists and, and the political, various political uh, players, but on both sides, you know, we would go up to press conferences in Parley with Karadich and his daughters and, and so on, as well as we would go to, to talk with Isabevich and Ganich and so on. So there was a lot of interaction between the journalists and, and all those other sort of actors, as it were, in, in the conflict, definitely. If I can just add to that, Paul, the, the, the relationship between the, the foreign journalists and the UN was, was an interesting one because, you know, normally at UN briefings, well, the, the, the tone could be quite hostile at times. And although I think many of the foreign calls, correspondents acknowledge that, you know, these people were on the ground doing a very difficult, sometimes impossible job, um, there, there was a, a, a tension uh, in these meetings at the, the nine o'clock follies in the PTT building. What is interesting, though, is that the, the pressure the journalists applied on the UN led to a situation whereby um, they were permitted to use UN vehicles to get to uh, the airport, for example. There was an organization established called the Sarajevo International Journalists Association, which arranged for local staff working for foreign correspondents to be given uh, transport to the airport and then permission to get on UN aid flights uh, in and out of the city. So th th that relation was quite a complex one, actually, between uh, UNPREFOR uh, and between the international journalists. Have we finished now? Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we are, we've got one minute. So if you wanted to make a last comment. Ma Maria Kenneth, wants to ask a your... question quickly. Maria, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I, but I, I think want, we've run out of time. So. <laughs> I think we've run out of time, which is really sad because we've got a couple of other questions. And yeah. I think um, um, there's a really interesting question from Adna about yeah. desensitization and images. So I'm going to use that instead to plug um <laughs> next event so we've got we've got two events coming up one one is the next um the next series in this in the war crime seminar series which is on the 9th of november and that's a talk on the evolving international law of peace by cecilia by and then we have paul back um on the 10th of november um on a panel on art and war and why does art and visual and images matter in war and i think perhaps we can pick up um, pick up in that panel discussion this this issue around what images are doing for us and and you know sensitization desensitization to them would be great so I would um, implore you all to join us for that it's part of the War Studies at 60 seminar series on the 10th of November um, so you can find the link to join up um, on the War Studies site but I will stop there and just say 
Um, thank you so much to Kenneth and to Paul um, for coming and talking to us about this book. It's absolutely fascinating. As I say, I think we could go on for hours. Um, it's such an interesting topic um, and your reflections are, are so, so interesting on it. Um, and then, you know, we've talked a lot about Sarajevo, but you can just imagine opening up the conversation to, to think about the links to other conflicts and the, the development of war reporting and all of those things. So I think we're going to have to get you both back um, again to, to talk about that at some stage. Um, but thank you both very, very much. Um, and thanks everybody for joining and for your questions. And thank you, James, too, for your comments. Um, so with that, I will say um, goodbye and end the webinar. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.